Welcome to Boring Programming Stream number 11. Uh, I'm Erichto and we're now both on YouTube and Twitch, hopefully. And we will be talking about Competitive Programmer's Handbook, a free book on competitive programming for beginners that I started reading several streams ago and now I'm planning to continue that. Mm, I will open my. I will open the chat. Final one. Yeah. Uh, hello, Dicky Novanto. Uh, I had some. I had some troubles with YouTube. There was like a Google outage, break, something like that, yesterday in the evening, and still YouTube isn't perfectly fine. I had trouble uploading some videos, and also with scheduling a stream. Hello, Shroud. Mm. I see that again there is some trouble with the chat. You should see messages popping above my head. Uh, hello, Aman. Mm. I need to change that in settings. Mm. Just give me one moment. And hopefully it works now. I and before I start, let me also change Twitch description. Uh, plus uh, test. No, it doesn't work. Mm. Why doesn't it work? You are really unlucky to get time in taxi during global round, else you won't have lost no tolerating. It's not about being unlucky. Uh, I got time in taxi because my solution was apparently quadratic. So problem F was something that I, after like 10 minutes, saw a randomized solution for, and I didn't see a counter test. I didn't know if it's correct or not, but it passed pretests. So I moved to another problem. I tried to solve the last problem then, instead of like thinking more about my previous problem. If you want to fight for first places, you can't stop and think for 15 minutes uh, to make sure you prove everything. And you just assume that, well, uh, like you accept the fact that from time to time you will get mm, wrong cancer on time limit exceeded on sys tests didn't get the notification on YouTube. Huh. Maybe because it wasn't scheduled before. And hello, Kartik and Math Buddies. Mm. Before we start, I want to fix the chat. Mm. And then Twitch description. This Okay, what about test here? Test 2. It works here, but not in OBS. Test 3. Sorry guys for troubles. Test 4. Nope, that's not it. Test 5. Still nothing. <laughs> hmm. But everything is displayed here correctly. If this problem of chat not popping above you in the video always happens during every time of streaming. Not really. Uh, there was a that issue happened in the previous stream and this one, but in the previous stream, like refreshing stuff in OBS helped. I don't think it helped now.
test six. That's a bit frustrating. Uh, let's change the title. This is boring programming stream number 11. We should be live on YouTube here. Huh. Okay, the the name is wrong. As I said, I th there are some troubles with YouTube. I need to change that as well. Mm. Yeah, that's a bit frustrating. Test six. Okay, uh, here we have competitive programmers handbook that. Mm. We should start in like five minutes. Competitive Programmer's Handbook. Uh, okay. I hope it's saved. Yeah, it looks fine. And I think we're set both on Twitch and YouTube now. I don't like the fact that it's doubled here, but whatever. Mm. I don't like the fact that it's doubled. And finally, Twitch description. The title isn't updated. It's updated here. Okay. So everything looks fine other than my chat. That doesn't work, the chat above my head. Mm. nine okay it magically worked or maybe it was about the I don't know YouTube titles YouTube settings mm, it's hard to understand okay we have the book that previously I went through a couple of chapters I think I noted some things about it maybe it will be in learning resources Mm. Not here. IOI syllabus. Nope. Maybe it's not there at all. I wonder if I removed it. I had some notes about it, about the chapters that I've read. I now I'm not even sure when I finished, on what chapter. Mm. But maybe we can start, I guess I went to like here maybe, complete search, read the algorithms. graph algorithms we can start either from here grid or dynamic or go to 
second chapter, but I don't think I went that far. So let's start from the second page of the mm, this indexes contents that is greedy algorithms. Uh, my goal isn't to learn something from here. My goal is to see how the author explains stuff, what mm, examples are made, and from this maybe I will know better how I should explain stuff. Uh, the minus point of it, it lacks of problem suggestions, so, but yeah, we can look for a certain problem with certain topics. Mm. But there are like, prob on the website with PDF, there is some problem set, though it's not r that related to the book. Mm. I think the author is fine with community suggesting suggesting some problems for or preparing for the book. It's just that it would be too much of a work for the author. Uh, greedy algorithm constructs a solution to the problem by always making a choice that looks be the best at the moment. Greedy algorithm never takes back its choices but directly constructs the final solution. For this reason, greedy algorithms are usually very efficient. The difficulty to find is to find the greedy strategy that always produces an optimal solution. Mm. Coins problem. If we have some coin, coin, coins denomination, the question is whether by, by paying some value from big values like if I have 160, I will pay first 100, then 50, then, six, then 10. Uh, we use each time the biggest coin we can. Then the, do we minimize the number of coins used this way? And here's a proof. Each coin one five blah 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 appears at most once. Otherwise, we would replace, for example, ten times two with a twenty. Coins two and twenty appear at most twice. We can show that uh, that. We can show for each coin x that it is not possible to optimally construct a sum x or any larger sum by only using coins that are smaller than x. Mm. We use the fact that uh, so f for every coin we set how many times we can use it. Also, we can use some combination described in this paragraph, and this is how we say coin 100 shouldn't be replaced with smaller coins. In general case. Mm. The smallest counterexample is coins denomination 134 and then if the target sum is 6 the optimal way to pay 6 is to use 2 coins free while the greedy takes 4, 1, 1. Then it may becomes a knapsack. Knapsack problem, basically. Mm, then we move to the next one. What is in, what I would add here is that greedy is always correct if coins denominations are divisors of each other. Every next coin is a multiple of the smaller one. Then we can prove that the greedy algorithm is optimal. If it isn't the case, for example, it isn't for coins 1, 2, 5, 10, 20, 50, and so on, then mm, it's hard to say, and it depends on the, on the test. But for divisors, like 1, 5, 10, 20, 80, 400, and so on, it always works. Scheduling. Mm. 
Given n events with their starting and ending times, find a schedule that includes as many events as possible. We have intervals and we must we must take the maximum number of disjoint intervals. However, it is possible to check in polynomial time if the greedy algorithm presented in this chapter works for a given set of coins. Hmm. Interesting. I didn't know that this is possible. Uh, how to get back? I clicked a link to something in the indices, whatever the name is, bibliography. But now how to get back where I was? Hmm. It's not that simple. And the greedy algorithm works after, basically, each time we take the interval ending leftmost, ending at earliest possible time, and we just take it. First idea is to select as short events as possible, but there are counter tests. Another idea is to always select the next possible event that begins as early as possible. But there is counterexample for that. Mm, third, select the next possible event that ends as early as possible. And this produces an optimal solution. One way to argue that the algorithm works is to consider what happens if we first select an event that ends later than the event that ends, ends as early as possible. So if that greedy first takes this interval, maybe an optimal solution uses something else instead, but then it's only harder to choose something in the future. Tasks and deadlines. This is solvable with greedy? Oh, this is, I guess this is some smart sorting and then dynamic programming. Let's see. Mm. Each task has duration and deadline. We need to do it before that deadline. Surprisingly, the optimal solution to the problem does not depend on the deadlines at all, but a correct greedy strategy is to simply perform the tasks sorted by their durations in increasing order. The reason for this is that if we even ever perform two tasks one after another, such that the first task takes longer than the second task, we can obtain a better solution if we swap the tasks. For example, consider the following schedule a greater than b, so we should swap the tasks. Maybe again I should take notes, like suggestions. Mm, I think that I wrote my suggestions previously here. Not really. I think I sent them to the author. Mm, but I can do it in my wiki. Where was would that be improved current notes? Uh, nope, not not edit. New page. Competitive programmer handbook. Notes and suggestions for competitive programmers handbook. Um, and maybe with a link.
Hello, Seraf. Uh, for the case. Sorry to come back to your binary search implementation for the case of finding first value that has true. Seems like your implementation cannot cover case for two values f. Uh, for example, that to find the first value that is greater than six. This is my my implementation. I interval is not from zero to n minus one. I add plus one if the value can be outside the interval. I think I even set that somewhere. Is it in my current notes? No, in my in codes, I guess. Binary search. It should say add plus one to right if the answer can be outside left right. So here put plus one if the answer is possibly outside of interval zero and minus one. Then it works. You put that as a comment. Exactly. Hello, former Nutella. Hello, Devarshi. How are you? I'm actually three times former Nutella. Mm. Read the algorithms. Say that uh, the greedy uh, if coins are divisors of each other, then the greedy always work works correctly. Can you tell me how to improve my dynamic programming skill? Read FAQ in the description. Maybe you can add a variable answer to initialize it to minus one if the answer is found and the answer is blah blah blah. Uh, well, there there are multiple ways to implement binary search. No use of asking. All answer you already know. Practice exactly. The answer as short said is practice. Or maybe he wrote something more, but he likes writing emojis that erase words from his messages. Mm. Okay, that was about coins, general case, scheduling. Okay, I'm surprised by that thing with deadlines. We should swap the tasks. I think that the problem with deadlines uh, let me think so how do we do it B yields zero points oh this tasks deadline and X is the moment when we finish the task. So deadline doesn't matter. Okay, then this problem is extremely confusing, at least to me, because I thought we need to finish the problem, uh, the task before the deadline. Otherwise, we get zero points. Uh, this time I put space. <laughs> okay, cool. You're learning something. Mm. Deadlines problem is very confusing. It makes mm, it's into it if that you get zero points if you don't finish before a deadline. Those 
artificial deadlines just increase the score the penalty the the score by d for each task mm. i think that if you get zero points after the deadline then I wonder, I think we should still sort increasingly by the duration and then do dynamic programming. That would be some solution. I think it's never optimal to use first longer duration task and then shorter. If we swap the order, the one on the left loses at most... Mm, I will start drawing something. This is what zero three zero six two competitive programmers handbook. Maybe again I can switch to black just to get used to that. Where was it? Page color black. this then should be white mm. if we have longer and then shorter task let's say that this length is a and this is b a greater than b then by changing the order to b and then a we improve the score for this second task by a plus a because it was finished by er a earlier and if we if this was before the deadline for this problem then it, it is also before the deadline here for the other task we removed from some score it was uh, like worse by b or less than that maybe here already there is a deadline for task A, but then we lose only that value. This was the previous score. And here it already went to zero. Mm, so in this case, uh, we would lose less than five, less than B. Uh, so instead of that, I will say minus B or less or less and a plus minus b is greater or equal zero so i can do the switch mm. or here we have like if b is five then here maybe instead of minus five we have minus three or minus two this is like if this is the distance uh, from the end of task a here to the deadline then actually we have a minus minimum uh, minimum of B and D and that is greater or equal zero um, in real life it is optimal if we do task with your duration first yes but maybe some subset of them we should first sort and then do DP on like when time is dimension I would say uh, 
the problem is mm, if we get zero points for finishing if we need to choose a subset of tasks and we should finish each of them before its deadline we should still sort by duration and then do dynamic programming with time as dimension time or score time is better as dimension and we should finish uh, if we need to choose a subset of tasks and finish each of them before its deadline then we should still sort by duration and then do dp do dp with uh, dp of time best possible score so far pref and time mm. yeah i think so uh, i know shroud but Eric is them good at dynamic programming have to practice a lot yes you can read in my wiki page how to practice. You feel like it's exchange argument. Exactly. This is uh, this is called exchange argument, and you can find algorithms live video about it or my blog that on code forces that is also called exchange argument. I even made a stream about it. Mm. We next consider a problem where we are given n numbers and our task is to find a value x that minimizes the sum. We focus on the case that and this. Mm. Is it greedy? I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, here we're saying something like there are usually what is happening is that uh, we have a long line where should I draw it? maybe here long line there are some people marked at positions A1, A2, A3, A4, A5 and we need to for example put some choose some place where they will meet maybe like here to minimize the total distance they cover here for the sum of absolute differences the difference a1 minus x this is the difference to chosen position x plus distance for person 2 and so on for this is this formula for c equal to 1 and then it they should meet at their median i wouldn't call that greedy is minimizing the sum of uh, how is it called is minimizing sums really greedy mm. okay case two is the where we should put it in the average of numbers if we want to minimize the sum over squares of distances here it's math not greedy we say something about a parabola where is it has minimum value 
data compression. I guess it will be about Hoffman codes. Do you have a good DP problem set for beginner intermediate? Uh, well, there is a coder DP contest, but it's not that much for beginners. So just go to, for example, code forces, so go to tag DP and sort problems by difficulty. Binary code assigns for each character of a string a code word that consists of bits. We can compress the string using the binary code. Mm. Okay, each character corresponds to some code. This is a constant length code, which means that the length of each code word is the same. Mm -hmm. We can compress the string better if we use a variable length code where code words may have different lengths. Mm. If you want to compress messages and we know that character A appears very often, then maybe we want to mm, like replace it with just a single digit, zero, and then other characters will be replaced with longer strings. None of them can start with a zero, because then we wouldn't know if it's A or the being of a different character. We require that no code word is a prefix of another code word, so that it could be unique to understand a code word. Mm. The following code is not valid because one zero is the prefix of that, and as an extra, this is prefix of that. We cannot distinguish between A, B, and C. Hoffman coding. Mm. Sort by difficulty, you can sort by problem rating. Number of persons solving it may be biased, but in my opinion. Mm. Yes, I guess sorting by problem rating is does exa exactly means sorting by difficulty. What else is difficult? Uh, the problem rating is its difficulty. Indeed, sorting by the number of accepted submissions isn't that mm, isn't that good mm, where were we here the Hoffman code is some algorithm that looks at two most common character and merges them I won't go through that in detail it builds a binary tree for for those code words we can imagine that as a try, that one goes to the right, zero goes to the left. This is a binary tree, and we do something with that. Chapter 7, Dynamic Programming. Mm. Dynamic programming. Technique that combines the correctness of complete search and the efficiency of greedy algorithms. Uh, greedy algorithms are more efficient than DP, right? Greedy algorithms are often li just linear. Dynamic programming is usually n square or so. DP can be applied if the problem can be divided into overlapping subproblems that can be solved independently. There are two uses for dynamic programming. Finding an optimal solution or counting the number of solutions. Coin problem. The DP algorithm is efficient because it uses memoization. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. It calculates the answer to each subproblem only once. 
I never like the idea of explaining DP through the overlapping sub problems. I never used it when thinking about problems. So I'm not sure if that's the best explanation, but I saw that term a lot of times, the overlapping sub problems. Usually when we go from left to right, I just think when we are at some state, what is important about decisions so far? What needs to be remembered as a state, as one of dimensions of DP? Is it important like, which jumps we made or something like that? Or how many jumps we made? I don't think in terms of overlapping subproblems, though it's of course very similar, I would say even equivalent. Formulate the problem recursively so that the solution to the problem can be calculated from solutions to smaller subproblems. Uh, what is the smallest number of coins required to form a sum x? The essential property of solve of x, solve of x being the minimum number of coins required to uh, create a sum x, mm, it can be cal uh, recursively calculated from its smaller values. And we have a recursive function. The constant inv denotes infinity. Mm. It's good here to say that mm, say that infinity is something like that because it could overflow when computing mm, in expression in, uh, when we do when we increase it by one. Say that inf is something like that because it could overflow. Uh, because for inf equal to int max, it could overflow. It will. It overflows when we increase it by one here. There may be an exponential number of ways to construct the sum. Next, we will see how to make the function efficient using a technique called mem memoization. memoization. Mm. Ready in the value. Value x is best, ready x is true. Okay, the function handles the base cases x smaller than 0 and x equal to 0 as previously. I usually prefer to just say that here, if I have uh, some that I want to get 10, they, then I simply I don't go to cases where I use coins bigger than 10. We can also iteratively construct the array value using a loop that simply calculates all the values of solve for parameters like that. Mm -hmm. In fact, most competitive programmers prefer this implementation because it is shorter and has lower constant factor. Factors? Don't we say constant factor? From now on, we will also use iterative implementations in our examples. Still, it is often easier to think about DP programming uh, DP solutions in terms of recursive functions. 
The thing is that it's hard to switch for people from recursive to iterative, at least from what I noticed. Mm. And has and has mm, top down versus bottom up. What do you prefer? I find it really hard to come up with bottom up. Uh, I just write it ir iteratively in the order that is suggested by the problem, usually from left to right. I don't know if this is top down or bottom up. The iterative version. There are already available int max and ulong max, maybe. I think that gives maximum value that can hold int. Maybe that can use as int. I just said why you shouldn't do it. Uh, if int is equal to int max, then it overflows for increasing something by one. You shouldn't use int max if you aren't careful. Billion plus five is safer, or two billion plus five. Mm. So I think here it might be hard for some people to move from recursive to iterative version. Mm, DP. I also prefer iterative version. I, like it's shorter for me. It's easier to think. Sometimes it's impossible to it's impossible to do some techniques or tricks with recursion. If we want to like build a segment tree over DP values, if we want to compute prefix minimum as we go, something like that. Constructing a solution. Sometimes we are asked to both, uh, both to find the value of an optimal solution and to give an example of how such a function can be constructed. In the coin problem, for example, we can declare another array that indicates for each sum of money the first coin in an optimal solution. After this, with the following code, we uh, the following code can be used to print the coins that appear in an optimal solution for the sum n. And then counting. Counting is much harder because you can overcount. It isn't an issue if you just want to find the best solution. Mm, here actually they count one one three and one three one as two different ways, and then it's fine. mention what happens when or, um, explain what happens when we don't care about the number of about the order of coins used this problem becomes harder if we treat 1, 1, 3 and 1, 3, 1 as the same way. The question is how to give some target sum as a multi set of coins, not caring about the order, because then we cannot use this for loop. I, I, we cannot use for x from 1 to n and then from coins, because then we count something multiple times, what is a big deal uh, in counting in the P. Uh, explain an issue of double counting. But magically, if we first iterate over coins and then over x, it works. 
Often the number of solutions is so large that it is not required to calculate the exact number, but to give the answer model M, where, for example, that. I don't recommend using a variable m, it's used for like the number of edges, stuff like that. Mm, maybe change m to mod in uh, when explaining that sometimes we need to compute the value modulo something. You can call recursive dp function many times in some order. Mm, that's true, but what are you saying? Like, what do we gain from this? You can call recursive dp function many times in some order. Yes, and after you implement, like, after you run iterative version, you can access a value as many times as you want in some order. Since DP can be used in many different situations, we will now go through a set of problems that show further examples about the possibilities of DP. Then you can use segment trees. Segment tree. You can call recursive DP function many times in some order. Then you can use segment tree. Uh, but I'm talking about a case that when we go through the P, we use segment tree already. Like maybe, uh, like what if DP of I, mm, DP of I is minimum over some range DP of, I don't know, from A to B for some A and B that were previously. And like maybe plus one, something like that. Then we should go through elements one by one and to compute dp of a, we take the minimum from some interval. Then we need segment tree, but we need that as we go, not in recursion. At least it's harder to do in recursion because it's harder to say whether interval a, b is already computed completely and put in a segment tree. Longest increasing subsequence. Two, five, seven, eight. Length denote, uh, let that denote the length of the longest increasing subsequence that ends at position k. If we calculate all values that, find out the length of the longest increasing subsequence. Calculate a value of length. We should find a position that. Mm. To compute the best longest increasing se subsequence ending at k, we are looking for previous position i that has smaller value and length of i is as large as possible. This code works in n square time because it consists of two nested loops. However, it is also possible to implement the DP calculation more efficiently in n log n. Can you find a way to do this? I guess it's fine for um, like beginner's book to not describe the harder uh, harder algorithm. Uh, maybe it would be good also to mention that it's possible to write it in a completely different way. Here, length of k denotes the longest increasing subsequence ending here. What is also n square, but thanks to that, where is my one note here? what is an alternative version still in n square but leading to a better solution is to define dp of i 
as the the smallest value value of increasing subsequence and uh, increasing subsequence of length i maybe let's not use i because that's usually index but here i can use like k this is also something that can be updated in n square but this one is easy to improve to n log n the smallest value of increasing subsequence of length k Mm. release you can mention an alternative solution mm, dp of k with dp of k the smallest value of increasing subsequence of length k the smallest value of the last element of the last element of an increasing uh, or last element the last, of an increasing subsequence of length k this is also of n square but can be easily improved to uh, of n log n. Mm. Paths in a grid. The the way he explains stuff or the, uh, everything in DP is. Mm, is with like a recursive thinking i guess to compute that we go through previous things okay paths in the grid uh, the rows and columns of the grid are numbered like that you can recursively calculate them sums as follows maximum that plus this okay the recursive formula is based on the observation that a path that ends at square y x cannot come either from square y x minus one or y minus one x thus we select the direction that maximizes the sum you assume that if y zero or x zero since the function sum has two parameters the dp array also has two dimensions let's calculate it as follows complexity n square and knapsack mm. we focus on the following problem given a list of weights uh, determine all sums that can be constructed using the weights for example if the weights are that the following sums are possible mm. the sum 7 is possible because we can select the weights 1 3 3 What does it mean constructed using the weights? Maybe mm. is it obvious that we can't reuse elements in the following quote? 
maybe it's better to say we have an items and we can choose some subset of them safe possible of x k true if we can construct a sum x using the first k weights To solve the problem, we focus on subproblems where we can only use the first k weights to construct sums. I'm not sure that. I think that this is hard part for someone that doesn't understand dynamic programming, but I'm not sure about it. We focus on subproblems where we only use the first k weights to construct sums. Mm. That possible xk true if we can construct the sum x using the first k weights. Hello, Amon. Welcome to the stream. The values of the function can be recursively calculated as follows. Mm, yeah. After we define the states, things are easy. I just wonder if this can be explained in a better way. DP is something that is hard to teach, I would say. How would I do it? I explain usually that we we look at elements one by one and after we are done with some of them maybe here are elements, uh, items after we are done with some of them what is important for already made decisions uh, we took some subset of those it isn't important what is the exact size of that sub set what is important is the sum of elements there then we need to know like, the prefix which uh, which items we already considered and the sum the value of the function can be recursively calculated as follows the formula is based on the fact that we can either use or not use the weight wk in the sum mm, and then transitions are easy I like the table, it shows which values will be true, the implementation, maybe for somebody this will not be obvious what this does in C++, but whatever. It would be everything would become too long if we started explaining stuff in C. Mm. Here is better implementation that only uses a one dimensional array possible that indicates whether we can construct a subset with some x. The trick is to update the array from right to left for each new weight. Mm. Okay, but this isn't easy. Why did we suddenly abandon one dimension? Not one dimension, the one dimension of array. Mm. It should be said that this way we, we don't allow a situation where we reuse some item. Okay. And the next problem will be edit distance. Mm. Can I explain this better? I would I guess I would add here that 
we should know if we just did this without iterating like if we did that without the second dimension of the array then we would allow reusing the same element multiple times and to fix that we can reverse the loop I think that would be a good explanation uh, but it isn't a big deal iterative dp is much faster than recursive dp uh, that's true it's faster recursive solution in knapsack problem with dp memorization technique gave me time and exceeded then i learned iterative approach from your your ad code educational dp video it works like charm charm cool mm. edit distance is some more complicated thing instead of edit distance I would here explain longest common subsequence this is easier than edit distance the longest common subsequence is a thing where you're given two strings and you find you want to like remove the minimum number of them to make them equal or in other words you want to what leaves what stays at the end is a common subsequence of both this is like a subset of upload operations here where we only remove characters mm. I think I will skip that counting tilings sometimes the states of a dp solution are more complex than fixed combinations of numbers as an example consider the problem of calculating the number of distinct ways to fill an n times m grid using 1 times 2 and 2 times 1 size tiles for example one valid solution for this grid is that the total number of solutions is this the problem can be solved using dynamic programming by going through the grid row by row each row in a solution can be represented as a string that contains m characters from the set what 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 okay he wants to remember for the previous row what was every tile in which of four directions it looked let's count kx denote the number of ways to construct a solution for rows 1k it says that the string x corresponds to row k after we're done with some prefix of rows what is important how the last row looks like mm. The time complexity is 4 to m. More compact representation for the rows. We can represent a row using only characters that and something else. Then there are 2 m rows. As a final note, there is also a surprising direct formula for calculating the number of tilings this formula is very efficient because it calculates the number of tilings in O of n times m but since the answer is a product of real numbers a problem when using the formula is how to store the intermediate results accurately I had no idea about this I guess it's just like Fibonacci numbers there can be some formulas though here it's more, much more surprising but we have some iteration it's not like a constant formula mm. there is 
a way to improve those solutions that in DP you remember the previous grid and you iterate over possible transitions to the next grid uh, to the, sorry to the next row from the previous row to the next row and that is to I think this is called broken profile if I remember correctly let's split the screen broken profile and then for a matrix as uh, state you remember the state of previous n cells but they aren't necessarily the whole row and then you're adding the next cell and removing the like the one above instead of something or like o of uh, from 2 to n where n is the width times 2 previously we had that because we had that many possible states and we considered transitions in this complexity now we just have 2 to the n times n or n square or even n cubic but this is much better and the technique is called broken profile mm. I think so, let me google tutorial on broken profile dp yeah, there is some block I guess this is the only block uh, but maybe you can google more stuff mm. for how was it? tilings? for counting tilings mention uh, broken profile technique broken profile technique just mentioned not necessarily explained chapter 8 amortized analysis this is something quite important just like the previous two chapters mm, two pointers two sum nearest smaller elements sliding window menu mm. time complexity of an algorithm is often easy to analyze just by examining the structure of the algorithm what loops does the algorithm contain uh, and how many times the loops are performed however sometimes a straightforward analysis does not give a true picture of the efficiency of the algorithm mm. estimate the total time used to all such operations during the execution of the algorithm instead of focusing on individual operations two pointers we're given an array of n positive integers and a target sum x and we want to find a subarray whose sum is x or report that there is no such subarray I think there are easier examples like you have a sorted array try to find two numbers that differ by exactly x and then you move with two pointers without having to store the sum of things in between there should be some pseudocode here i would say we don't have any pseudocode Okay, uh, the 
chapter is amortized analysis. And the first suggestion is uh, give some code or pseudocode for two pointers. Then to some problem. Given an array, target some, find two values such that their sum is x, or report that no such values exist. We first sort the array values in increasing order, then we try it with two pointers. Uh, it is possible to solve the problem in another way in n log n time using binary search. In such a solution, we iterate through the array and for each value, uh, array value, we try to find another value that it's yields the sm sum x. This can be done by performing n binary searches. Uh, I will say we iterate through the array. mention that the binary search solution for the sum also also requires requires sorting to just change that to uh, through the sorted array When and where can I download or read this book? See the description. I hope it is in the description. Mm, yeah, it's here. Link. Right. I'm just making sure it works. Here's a blog about it that has some discussion, but there is also a link, and here you can download the book here PDF and view the project on GitHub. There is also like a slightly bigger version of, on that that you can pay for, but the handbook is, I think, very nice for beginners. So no worries. Okay, mm. a more difficult problem is the free sum problem that asks to find three array values whose sum is x. Using the idea of the above algorithm, this problem can be solved in n square time. Can you see how? For a long time it was thought that solving the free sum problem more efficiently than in, in square time would not be possible. However, in 2014 it turned out that this is not the case. So free sum can be solved faster than n square. How? Uh, in proceedings, blah blah. blah. Foundation computer. I believe that it's hard. And again, how do I go back to where was I? Is there a button for that? Rotate, get back will not work like I want it to work. I can bookmark stuff. Before going to bibliography, I should mark like bookmark a moment where I'm right now. Okay, uh, contents. I was in two pointers method. Nearest smaller element. Page eighty nine. Uh, I was much earlier, right? I was page seventy nine. Hmm. Uh, anyway, 79, right. But yeah, you can scroll back uh, stream for like a minute to see what page I was on. PDF page. So this is different than PDF page. How do I go to PDF page? Oh, indeed. So this is 79 here, but 89 in total. And I can just play that. Control L works? No. 89. Okay, thanks. Mm. 
As an example, consider the problem of finding for each array element the nearest smaller element. That is, find the first smaller element that precedes the element in the array. First smaller element that precedes Precedes means is before, right? Then it's strange that here he says the first smaller. It's like the closest, the nearest. The first might suggest being the first from the left. It is possible that not no such element exists, in which case the algorithm should report this. Maintain a stack of array elements. At each array position, we remove elements from the stack until the top element is smaller than the current element or the stack is empty. Then we report that the top element is the nearest smaller element. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, I talked about it recently for some temperature problem on lead code. That... Mm, when we can imagine things from the input as columns and after you're done with some uh, with some prefix then what are possible next what are possible results for future things I think these two columns here for whatever there will be on the right, I want to know what is the previous smaller value. If I have something like that, then this will be the next smaller value. If I have something like that, then this is the next smaller value. Those two don't, do not matter anymore. Mm, let's say that now I have something like that. Then this will be the answer for this new one and I can remove this guy. It will not be an answer for anybody anymore. Then I have something else here. Then I just add it and this is the answer. This was the answer. Then I have something like that. Then I remove the previous guy because it was too big. And I say this is the answer and so on. I always have a stack of increasing stuff and when I have a new element I know that it makes those that were higher not usable anymore they will not be answer for anybody in the future I can remove them and then the stack um, stays increasing the complexity is linear because you add element each element to the stack at most once so you will remove at most n elements from the stack because at most n elements will, will be added to the stack I like the sometimes to visualize stuff like here with columns for heights it helps at least it helps for me we go through the array from left to right and maintain a stack of array elements. At each array position, we remove elements from the stack until the top element is smaller. Uh, I don't like the fact that in editorials and books, they just say what is the solution. Mm, there should be some logic, some ideas for that. Here, maybe I, again, did something similar. I described what solution does basically but at least I said those will never be the answer anymore so I can remove them in my YouTube videos on the main channel Aristo I try to give some insights I'm, I'm trying to say something more than what usually editorial says we report that the top element is the nearest element small, nearest smaller element of the current element mm. The efficiency of the algorithm depends on the total number of stack operations. If the current element is larger, mm, that sometimes the stack can contain several larger elements that it takes time to remove them. Still, each element is added exactly once and removed at most once. 
thus each element causes one stack and the algorithm works in all of them yes. sliding window minimum this is something solvable with stack, I will skip this but it isn't amortized complexity it's something similar Okay. chapter 9 range queries If you want to see what I'm writing here, you can go to my GitHub wiki. The link to GitHub is in the description or just go to FAQ. And on the right, there are several different things. Mm. For amortized analysis, we had to give some code to the code for two pointers and mention that the binary search solution for two sum requires sorting too. Uh, yeah. Streaming more often past few days. I'm trying to do three times per week, just like the schedule on Twitch says. Monday 12 o'clock, Tuesday 9 o'clock, Friday 12 o'clock. I'm trying to keep that up for the next two or three weeks until around 20th of June. Then I will go uh, to, to some programming camp for three weeks. I, I won't be in Warsaw. I will not stream at all and then in July I will see whether I want to keep that or not oh today's stream Friday uh, maybe this should be today's stream Monday or I should remove Monday I think I shouldn't remove it mm, because when somebody sees on the next day when I don't have a stream the something about today's stream he will think or she that this is for today why not stream from a camp because I'm not sure what internet connection is will be there what conditions there will be plus I will not have time and the last thing is that I don't think that my power is that I don't think that my laptop is powerful enough maybe I'm able to stream in some bad resolution from a laptop but I'm not sure and I think it could overheat in like five hours mm, I think I tested that like months ago how good it is for streaming and it there were glitch there were gl sorry there were glitches and they weren't because of some software issues just that CPU was 100% busy what is strange because this is uh, this is not a bad laptop this is like Huawei MateBook X Pro quite new laptop with not so bad CPU mm, but I guess still PC computers have an advantage of being bigger so they have better mm, they don't overheat i'm not sure about that they have better cooling integrated video card uh, if you're asking about the graphics card then there is some mm, not integrated card but it's not very good like M mx150 if this is what you're asking about mm, this one MX150 GeForce uh, I think CPU is more of a limitation for streaming because there is a lot of encoding mm, and before I go to chapter 9 I will grab something to drink.
maybe it would be better if I had um, a big laptop, one of those gaming laptops. They are bigger, they have better CPU and GPU, but I wanted mine to be very like slick and it is very light. It is easy for me to travel with a laptop because it's just small. We move to chapter 9 in Competitive Programmer's Handbook. We went through now what? Greedy, dynamic programming and amortized analysis. Mm. Now range queries. Some queries. Some queries are possible to be solved with prefix sums. First focus on a situation where the array is static. Notice the array values are never updated between the queries. In this case, it suffices to construct a static data structure that tells us the answer for any possible query. Mm. Prefix sum array. The same can be done for 2D, this is what they're saying. It's also possible to generalize this idea to higher dimensions. For example, we can construct a two-dimensional prefix sum array that can be used to calculate the sum of any rectangular subarray in O of one time. Mm. Minimum queries. There is quite simple and log n time preprocessing method after which we can answer any minimum query in all of one time. This is what I thought is called KMR, but recently I, s I heard that it's called. What was it? Basic indexing, BOF, sparse table. Is this sparse table? Mm, let me first read and then think. The idea is to calculate all values that where the length is power of 2. The number of calculated values is n log n because there are log n range lengths that are powers of 2. The values can be calculated efficiently. I was asked about it where in some recent stream. Mm. So I mentioned KMR. On Richter 2. By the way, you might notice that I re uploaded to the second channel several boring programming streams. I thought that there are five of them to re-upload, mm, but I saw the sixth one now on the main channel, so I need to also upload it here. What takes some time, those are seven hour videos. They take a lot of time to process, upload or download. Mm, and I'm just cleaning the, cleaning the main channel and uh, putting everything here. Where was that comment? It could be somewhere here. Zero comments. Not this one. I think I answered to somebody incorrectly and I'm trying to find it. I don't see it. Anyway, uh, so because I named something KMR, somebody asked me about it. I asked some friends and they told me a name that I don't remember now. It, the, sh the acronym was BOF. Base, basic something. But apparently it's called sparse table.
Uh, sparse table. Geeks for geeks. Okay, I will make sure that this is called KMR in Polish. But KMR is for strings usually. Again, for lengths that are power of 2. It's not here. Uh, KMR. Mm. I guess KMR, KMR is sparse table but for strings. Uh, anyway, let's read exactly what happens here. And the idea is to compute the minimum as per processing for each interval that has size that is a power of 2, like for all intervals of size 2, 4, 8, up to the biggest power of 2 that doesn't exceed n. Mm. And then we, when you have a query, you can ask about the prefix of that query that is here size 4 and here suffix that is size 4. Biggest power that doesn't exceed the size of an interval. BIT. Or Fenwick tree can be seen as a dynamic variant of a prefix sum array. It supports uh, two log and time operations on array processing a range sum query and updating a value. Implementation. I don't like. BIT because when I learned I learned segment tree first standard segment tree and those I'm not used to using BIT or Fenwick it's the same thing because of that I'm surprised that somebody described BIT before standard segment trees but I will read maybe the description is easy I know what they do, but the implementation is kind of magical with some bits that aren't that obvious. Mm. I would say that you should learn segment tree, and then BIT is an extra that allows to do something like twice faster, maybe but it isn't able to solve all the pr segmentary problems. We assume that all arrays are one indexed because it makes the implementation easier. Let p k denote the largest power of 2 that divides k. For example, for 6 it would be 2. 12, 4. We store a binary index tree as an array tree such that tree of k is mm, sum q that what is sum lowercase q that is each position k contains the sum of values in the range of the original array whose length is that and adds at this position for every position we care about the biggest power of two that divides that and this is the sum or whatever that we store Any value, sum, that is prefix sum, can be calculated in log n time. Mm -hmm. BIT works only for prefixes, right? It cannot solve a general question about sum subarray. Yes, it cannot, because, for example, nothing represents this interval. And only that. 4 is only together with 1. Then I think this is a bad thing to explain. 
I will say BIT is uh, segment trees are better than BIT because they can answer they can solve more solve more problems so minimum mm, intervals that are not prefixes prefixes and then so it might be better to explain them instead of BIT. We can calculate the correspond. Yeah, he explains how to use um, BIT. Mm, after updating a value in the original array, several values in the binary index tree should be updated. For example, if the value at position 3 changes, the sums of the following ranges change. I like this format. Mm. I know I don't know whether I should make a note on that, but maybe I can. I like the drawing page on page uh, what is this 88 90, 98 in PDF that shows which intervals are affected by a change which intervals in BIT are affected by a change uh, can I skip learning BIT? Yes, I think so. Segment trees are more important in my opinion. Mm, BIT can do a subset of things that segment tree does. It isn't enough to just learn BIT, then just learn segment trees. BIT are slightly faster, but only for those problems that they can solve, and they have mm, memory that is twice smaller instead of array. Segment tree needs 2n array, mm, BIT needs only n. The operations of a BIT can be efficiently implemented using bit operations. <coughs> Following function calculates the value like that. Mm. And this is some magic. You shouldn't just learn an algorithm and believe that if you do k minus equal k and minus k then something good happens i don't like that segment tree the bottom-up implementation disruptor corresponds to that in, uh, similar structures were used in late 1970s to solve geometric problems segment tree is a data structure that supports two operations processing a range query and updating an array value Mm, they also super fast to code. Uh, are they? Let's see. So what can they do? They can find some in interval, right? And changing some some index. So let's see. Uh, timer. Not timer, stopwatch. How much does it take to implement a segment start? Mm, we need to initialize uh, tree of base plus i is a of i. I need in my implementation. I'm finding uh, the biggest power of two that doesn't exceed n. And then I use vector of three int three of two times b. I put values in some leaves. Then maybe this should be long, long. It's safer. 
and b minus 1 up to the root 3 of i is 3 of 2 times i plus 3 of 2 times i plus 1 then mm, update is for i for i don't know x or j is b plus i uh, if i changed to some new value mm, then also 3 of b plus i is equal a of i and for everything from b plus i divided by 2 to the root so to the root we are going through the path by the path to the root 3 of j is the sum and sum in interval sum is 0 uh, sum is 3 of in interval l to r plus equal b r plus equal b now those are positions of uh, leaves 3 of l if uh, l is not r then sum plus equal 3 of r while l plus 1 is more than r while they are not neighbors if l modulo 2 is 0 sum plus equal 3 of l plus 1 if r modulo 2 is 1 then add the left child sum plus equal 3 of r minus 1 and l divided by 2 r divided by 2 and we have a sum it took me two minutes and a half but obviously i explained stuff as i mm, while i implemented that mm. now what do we need for uh, for this we have sum okay how do we, we initialize here increases the array value at position k by x this is something easy, easier for me uh, but I implemented that in general case that works for also for minimum maximum or whatever now I can change the sum into minimum or maximum what BIT cannot do uh, so for this thing instead of that this is for bit and i have for j is b plus i over uh, not over 2 that j greater or equal 1 j divided by 2 mm, 3 of j plus equal the difference this is not longer than this uh, and it's easier to understand because we divide by two instead of doing something random so this is shorter mm, but here i will leave the version that works for minimum and maximum too then we have sum sum is for sure faster than what i implemented here but what do we save half a minute to code this without implement without thinking what to say again stopwatch let's measure the time it's 35 seconds instead of I guess something like 10 for this one so does it matter 25 seconds of a difference mm. and we can solve five times more problems because it can do everything then I don't think it's important to know BAT 
and just I hide it for this magic with bits. Minus equal that, plus equal that. If you really understand what you're doing, then I'm fine with that. Mm. Segment tree. The advantage of a segment tree is that it c is a more general data structure. Well, BIT only supports uh, BIT only supports some queries. Segment trees also support other queries. On the other hand, a segment tree requires more memory and is a bit more difficult to implement. It is not more difficult to implement than this thing. How do you come up with that? I'm segment tree also has implementations that are shorter than mine. This can be compressed nicely to something still not shorter than this one, but then I can implement I can implement that in twenty seconds. But it's not about the time to implement, it's about the understanding to and how easy it is to understand and to debug. Because okay, maybe BIT isn't that bad to debug. Uh, what will you do in this problem? You have an array, blah blah blah. You have an array in queries print true if there is an interval of size x that in this interval there is a number divided divided all the numbers in the interval. Uh, well, give me a link to a problem. Ask. Here's a, an FAQ for asking questions. I don't want to solve problems from outgoing competitions. Mm. And I don't understand what is divided here, by the way. Is divisible by or divides? Yeah, I, I don't get that part anyway. Structure. Segment tree is a binary tree such that the nodes on the bottom level of the tree correspond to the array elements. Turns out that any range can be divided into log n ranges whose values are stored in the tr in three nodes. Mm, well, actually, yeah, I agree that it's hard to start with segment trees. Mm. Another way to calculate the sum. Maybe I should revise my code. Maybe I should switch the way I implement it because it's not short. It's not very nice. I saw plenty of easier implementations. Mm. In particular, I think we could here do... I think it would help to do that. Then we don't need this part. And is that this? Is that it? I'm not sure. I have some notes in my wiki about... Where is it? Uh, learning resources. For segment trees, I said that this is best explanation, but I didn't like the implementation. Because it used some tricks with bits. Yeah, this is how... So we increase both by n, and while l smaller than r, we divide both by 2. Okay, we're doing the same thing I did, but thanks to the fact that r is increased by 1, so interval doesn't start at r, it uh, doesn't add at r, it ends at r minus 1. Just like what I tried to do here now, by adding 1. And then we're doing the same thing. It's slightly more complicated to understand. 
but this implementation takes maybe 10 seconds more than the BIT. It can do a lot more. And I completely do not agree with this ugly implementation in one line. Just write it in three lines, it will be nicer. sum from this interval. The following two three nodes correspond to the range. This one is that those four and then those two. Another way to calculate the sum is this. When the sum is calculated using nodes located as high as possible in the tree, at most two nodes on each level of the tree are needed. Hence the total number of nodes is that. When the sum is calculated using nodes located as high as possible, at most two nodes on each level of the tree are needed. Mm. That's true, but not easy to understand. After an array update, we should update all nodes whose value depends on the updated value. The path to the root. This can be done by traversing the path from the updated array, array element to the top node and updating the nodes along the path. Mm. Implementation. I think a very important thing to add would be explain how to initialize BAT and segment tree. Mm. It isn't okay. You don't really have to know BIT. This is my opinion. How to initialize BIT and a segment? Mm. The following function calculates the value of sum in some interval. Uh, while I a smaller equal b, if a is the right child, increase by this one and add one. I don't like what happens. The function maintains a range. At each step, the range is moved one level higher in the tree, and before that. The values of nodes that do not belong to the higher range are added to the sum. The following function increases the array value at position k by x. Mm, yes, that is easier. Just like uh, just like a week ago with binary search, now I wonder what is the superior implementation of segment trees. First, the function updates the value at the bottom level of the tree. After this, this, this is here. After this, the function updates the values of all internal tree nodes until it reaches the top node of the tree. Both work in log and time. Mm. Let me think for a moment for this implementation because apparently it's quite common. So this is segment tree. We have a tree. Sorry for off top. If you read this, can you say how to make better at competitive programming? Go to FAQ. Read question how to practice. Mm. But the question, the answer to your question is to make better you should practice and in my github wiki there is section how to practice as well. 
I will not repeat the answer each time because I'm asked that every day. Sometimes more than once. When we have, let's also put one more level. Thanks, you're welcome. We have some interval. Then what happens? Initially A is here, B is here. If A is the left child, I don't have to add this. Instead I'm moving up. And I will add this value instead in a moment. For the right child, uh, I shouldn't add this value. Exactly I should add this. With green I will mark, I will mark what values are added. So this one is added then I need to move blue to the left because otherwise I'm, I will be here and I might try to add it this is incorrect I'm moving blue here this is that minus minus in implementation and then it moves up it will be there in the next step then for A in the next step this is the right child so it should be added and when we add it we move it to the right and then moves up. Mm, for the right end this is added because it's the left child. The, the value modulo 2 is 0. Uh, basically when you check the parity of index even value means you are left child of your parent and odd value means your right child. And after this is added, we move to the right and up. Mm, what now? This is the right child, so we add this. This is left child, so we add this. And both move like that. Now this is A, this is B. And it's not true anymore that A is smaller than B, because we repeat while A smaller equal B. And now they like, swapped places. Mm. Is it possible that A and B will become equal? What happens if A is equal to B initially? If A is equal to B initially, then this happens, and one of those conditions will be true. For example, if A and B are odd, then this will be true. We will add this value, 3 of this position, then move A to the right, so A now will be bigger than B. Because it was odd, it will change, for example, from 7 to 8. Then even after dividing my 2, this will be bigger. Cool. And um, can A become equal to B after some time? Let's try to think about this. Uh, if the starting situation is like that, A and B, then they will become equal. In the first step, A is the left child, so we do nothing, we just move to the parent. B is the right child, so we do nothing, we move to the parent. Mm, and now A will be equal to B, and just like in the analysis a moment ago, it will be odd or even, so one of the additions will happen. Mm. Okay, fine. I n I'm not convinced to this implementation, but I'm not saying that mine is much better. My logic is to say that Mm, when we have that interval, no, sorry, not interval, segment tree,
then when we start from some value a I'm going up up and so on and when I'm the left child then I need to add the right child so want let's say the other vertex is here they will eventually meet and while they go up I need to add what was between them I will add those green vertices this is this adds everything that is strictly between A and B and in my implementation I need extra plus for the start and end value because my my solution where I just go up and if I see that for the left part this one if I see that something is there to the right so if I'm like this vertex is a left child of its parent then I'm adding the right child because this is like between A and B and the sum of those green values will be the answer Mm, this is not the most efficient solution because we could merge those two into this one and then those two into this vertex mm, but still the complexity is logarithm I just go up and I add at most two log n vertices just sometimes it could be a bit better but the worst the complexity so the worst case is the same other queries examples of such queries are minimum maximum greatest common divisor uh, with operations segment tree can do a lot of things for example minimum and we can even find the uh, allows to us to use binary search for locating array elements for example, if the tree supports minimum queries, we can find the position of an element with the smallest value in log n time. That's a cool extra. Additional techniques. Index compression. Mm. Range updates. We have implemented data structures that support range queries and updates of single values. Let us now consider an opposite situation where we should update ranges and retrieve single values. We focus on an operation that increases all elements in range by x. If we want to minimize everything in range, then we need to push values down, right? Or not? Not, we don't have to, okay. Uh, we can use the data structures presented in this chapter also in this situation. We built a difference array. Oh, okay. He does some trick to solve a version where we increase elements in range A, B by X and then answer for a single value. But we could do just what was described previously here uh, but treat for intervals implement update instead of the sum and it will work and then for answering about the value go through that path I don't like the fact that here we're doing something special something mar ma some magical observation for a problem that doesn't require it this should teach readers how to use segment tree also in that other case because this trick will be impossible to use for minimum okay, I will note that Range updates can be done not only 
only for uh, sums and we don't need prefix uh, an array of differences for that mm. just do the same thing as previously but update things for but uh, the update function will uh, do something with interval the same way as previously described chapter 10 will be bit manipulation and before that mm, let me again see contents okay maybe i can now do chapter 10 and then finish with competitive programmers handbook for today bit manipulation all data is stored as bits blah 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 the bits in the representation are indexed from right to left to convert a bit to number we can use this formula by the way if you're a new viewer and you're just Mm. Uh, you've just discovered this stream I'm now reading some book about competitive programming and I want to see how the author explains stuff maybe this way because I also teach I also do videos on algorithms maybe I will see some ways how to explain something easier, nicer mm. plus I'm writing down suggest suggestions for the author I will send it to him. This is PDF in the internet, so it's not that hard to correct. There aren't actually mistakes. It's about suggest, suggesting something easier or better. The bit representation is signed or unsigned. Two's complement is used, which means that the opposite number of a number is calculated by first inverting all the bits, then increasing the number by one. Two's complement is this some special term. Uh, mathematical operation on binary numbers and is an example of a radix complement. Complement with respect to 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 them. This is two to the n minus the number. We can flip all the bits and then increase by one. Fine. I didn't know that, and it doesn't look important, at least for competitive programming. Uh, maybe if I thought for a moment how these are represented, I would get that, but I never heard that term and it doesn't sound important for CP. Only non-negative numbers can be used, mm, but the upper bound for the values is larger. The following code shows that the signed number x equal to minus 43 equals the unsigned number dot. If a number is larger than the upper bound of the bit representation, the number will overflow. 
and that and this is a very common mistake in programming bit operations and bit one bits in positions where both x and y have one bits for example that Mm, or operation XOR NOT I don't think I, I don't think I ever used NOT in my code bit shifts this is what I do use often to check if the IF bit is on I do IF M and this is one shifted by i which is 2 power i and i compute and with that to check if the i bit in mask m is on or not mm. application Ex oh exactly that mm. It is also possible to modify single bits of numbers using similar ideas. The formula that sets the cave bit of x to 1 mm, actually doesn't set it, it returns a number x but with this bit set to 1. The formula and sets the cave bit to 0, mm, this inverts the cave bit. that sets the last one bit of x to zero mm. does it? yes, I think it does x and minus x sets all the one bits to zero except for the last one bit oh, there are a lot of things This is a nice hack to check if num if x is in the power of 2. It would be nice here to write down what is actually important. There are a lot of things that somebody might try to remember and go through them and spend several hours understanding. And I would write down the important ones. Mm, I don't think I use that. I don't think I use that. Actually, nothing from this paragraph. I use that all the time and this one just to do something with the cave bit and this is usually enough and built-in pop count this is extremely important thing from this 90% of time if you need something from those functions from those four, four it will be pop count Every subset can be represented as an n bit integer whose one bits indicate which elements belong to the subset. Yeah. To iterate over subsets of a set, we can iterate over masks up to 2 to the n, and every mask will say will tell you which elements should be taken and which are not. set implementation mm. hmm. subset of that set is this even define what he does here so is this defined behavior the int suggests things from 2 to minus 30 uh, minus 2 to the 31 to 2 to the 31 minus 1 and i think because of that this is undefined behavior you shouldn't overflow uh, signed values
in that set implementation change int x to unsigned x or unsigned x int x overflowing uh, assigned variable is undefined behavior I'm not 100% sure about it, but I think it is. Mm, so you should use here unsigned if you need values from 0 to 31, including 31. Up to 30, int is fine. Set operations. Mm, intersection, union, complement, difference. Iterating through subsets. The following code goes through the subsets of a set X. And this is something valuable. You should mm, you should remember how to do it. Otherwise, uh, the code becomes complicated with some recursion. This code in O of two to the k iterates through the subsets of set B of size k. B is equal B minus X and X. Hmm. I knew a different implementation. B minus X and X. I use something completely different, something like S and B and or M minus A times initial B. Something like that, I think. But whichever works, whatever. Bit optimizations. Mm. Humming distance. The length is the number of positions where the strings differ. Go through all pairs of strings and calculate their Hamming distances, which yields in n squared times k algorithm. Mm. Yes, if we want to compare two strings that are each in form of uh, zeros and ones, you can cast that to bit sets or values and then use bit operations indeed counting subgrids calculate the number of subgrids whose all corners are black that's a cool example i like it you're looking for uh, force of vertices that form corners and they are all ones and then for two rows that contain them, they should have those two positions in common. Uh, we divide the grid into blocks of columns such that uh, n. Okay. This resulting algorithm works in n cubic divided by n times. We generated a random grid of size that and compared the original and the bit optimized implementation. 30 seconds and 3 seconds. And 1.7 with that. Uh, okay, what about the bit sets? Mm. We don't have to split into something. C is able to do that for us. Uh, explain bit sets for counting subgrids dp mm. consider the following problem we are given the prices of k products over n days and we want to buy each product exactly once 
We are allowed to buy at most one product in a day. What is the minimum total price? And here, the one dimension of DP will be the mask, I guess, of the products. Mm. From permutations to subsets. There is an elevator with maximum weight X and N people with known weights who want to get from the ground floor to the top floor. What is the minimum order of rights needed if the people enter the elevator in an optimal order? Mm, this is maybe not the best example for how to move from permutations to subsets, because here it's obvious that not the order of people matters. The order is what subsets enter the elevator. But there are problems like, uh, I don't know, uh, count permutations with k inversions for a given k of size n with n inversions for given n and x. And then you can indeed, instead of iterating over permutations, a state of dp has for some mm, prefix already, the mask that says which numbers you chose and how many inversions they produced. Then you know for new number how many new inversions it will cause. This will be the number of bigger numbers before and the mask gives you that. Actually this problem is even possible to solve in polynomial time. Mm, in short I will tell you that for the prefix you just consider that you have values from 1 to k here and when you have a new number here, you decide which one it should be from 1 to 5, maybe it should be 2, then it shifts all the numbers, pre all the previous numbers up. Mm, so it's just dp of i and inversions already. This is up to n squared, this is up to n. So this is n cubic plus we iterate over that, which is n to the 4, maybe it's possible to improve to n cubic. Mm. I think so, with some prefix sums. Mm. Anyway, I don't like this example because it's... I wouldn't say that this should be solved with permutations. One optimal order is that with partitions the people into two rights. The problem can be easily solved in this time, or maybe it's good that the problem is obvious for subsets, and this is a good example that teaches you something about subsets. Mm. Go for all people who belong to S and optimally choose the last person P who enters the elevator. I don't understand that. It's a sub problem. Writes last. We set the value for an empty group as follows. Mm, what does this mean? Uh, Right is the minimum number of rights for subset S, and last is the minimum weight of the last right. Okay. Mm. The more straightforward solution will be to iterate over the set of people that now enter an elevator. I would explain it this way. Counting subsets. DP on masks, basically. And part two will be graph algorithms. I think we'll finish today f with competitive programs handbook. I will move to something, ex something else. I'm done with the whole chapter one, basic techniques. There will be graph algorithms, basics of graphs, traversal, 
Shorted paths, tree, spanning trees, directed graphs, strong connectivity, flows, advanced topics, combinatorics. Mm. I'm not sure if it's good to learn about things like Kiley's formula and Burnside's lemma just after binomial coefficients. This is a very easy thing, while this become quite hard. Matrices, probability, game theory, string algorithms, square root algorithms. Segment trees revisited. Lazy, dynamic trees, data structures. What is data structures? And two dimensionality. Geometry, sweep line. Okay. Uh, code forces, not broken profile. I want to take a look if there is something new, interesting in code forces. Mm. Can we do this problem in a better way? Somebody answered that? Let's see, system of equations. This can be, we can do this using brute force method. Does a better way exist? Please share it, thanks. Mm. Loves math lessons very much. He doesn't attend them. Blah blah blah. You're given a system of equations: a squared plus b is n, a plus b squared is m. How many pairs of integers satisfy the system? Uh, I would iterate over A, from this we get B, and we check if the second if the second equation is correct. The complexity of that will be square root of n. I just need to iterate over A. A Or does the tutorial say that? No. We turn it over A up to mm, square root of N compute B for each A compute B from the first equation and check if the second equation holds. The complexity is of square root of n. If you want something better, have fun with uh, ugly equations. Compute B from the first equation and check if the second equation holds the complexity is that if you want something better, have fun with ugly equations. Mm. I don't like the fact that people who are inexperienced take random problems and they ask about whether they can be solved for bigger constraints. Like why do you care? If you want harder problems, there are harder problems. Just go to problems even in the same contest and go to C, D or E. Like if making this problem uh, harder like with bigger constraints was valuable and e possible, then usually authors would do that. There are literally thousands or tens of thousands of problems and beginners try to take something easy and modify that without experience. That doesn't make sense. 
What else? Mm. John Easy. This John Easy is a hacker contest, okay. There were some issues with a problem. Add coder contest. Add coder contest have good quality. Some I heard some people complain that it was a bad problem set, uh, too, too many greedy problems, something like that. I didn't notice that because after B I jumped to F and I solved it, though I was stuck for a long time with one thing mm, but because of that I missed three problems in the middle maybe I can check that now CDE I heard that E is not so hard you're given a tree of size up to 2000, a string S consisting of characters 0 and 1, representing the number of pieces placed on vertex I. Mm, I don't want that. Okay. Choose two pieces that this uh, will perform. Snook will perform the following operation some number of times. Choose two pieces the distance between which is at least two and bring these pieces closer to each other by one. It looks very similar to Code Forces problem. More formally choose two vertices, each with one or more pieces. Consider the shortest path between them, at least two edges. Move one piece from U to its adjacent vertex on the path and move one piece from V to its adjacent vertex on the path. Snook wants to have all the pieces on the same vertex. Is this possible? Mm. Hmm. Maybe I should iterate over vertex to which all tokens will go to mm. what then if I have something here there are some subtrees growing from the vertex that I chose And I can decide to choose two vertices from different subtrees and pull them to get pull them closer to the chosen vertex. Or I could choose two vertices from the same subtree and pull them together. Here is a case when both got closer to the fixed vertex. Mm. But I'm sure it's also possible that one of them will go further away. Like here. I can take those two and put them closer to each other. Is this some kind of DP? When this vertex maybe would, should be treated as the root. I'm not sure about that. Then for every subtree in the tree, I need to know whether whether what.
how many moves I need or for each number of operations can I put everything to this vertex in that many operations It would be easier if each time an operation is made, it's just that two vertices are pulled closer to the root. But it isn't necessarily a case. I can take this vertex, this one, and one of them goes down, the other goes up. I'm thinking about some dp of v. Then I don't know the operation, the number of operations made, the number of vertices up will be the number of vertices that are mm, outside of this tree that were pulled closer to this tree. I mean this subtree of V. These are some ideas. There's editorial. If you want to train, like practice for contests, you shouldn't quickly go to the editorial. It's just that I don't have that much time in a week and I'm not focusing on practicing. I just want to see a solution. Mm. Like perfectly, what I should do after I solved ABF during a contest in two hours, I should just try to solve those in Maybe hour and a half should be enough. Uh, but I don't feel a need to get better. I just want to see some cool problems and that's it. Fix certain vertex as the root and check if we can move all tokens to the root. We want to do this in O of N. Mm, that, that my first idea was correct. Suppose that there is a sequence of operations that moves all tokens to the root. Then we can prove that we can do that even with the following addi additional restrictions. Let's call an operation but if this operation moves one of the tokens downward. There is a valid sequence of operations without any but moves. Okay. I would consider that after a moment. And then can I solve it already if everything is pulled toward mm, the root? I think the question will be for this subtree hmm. for this subtree is it better for the outside to make an operation that chooses those two and pulls them up or maybe each of them should be pulled together with somebody from the outside. <clears throat> what if I know for this subtree the total distance that those vertices have to vertex V? Let's call that total distance like L, sum of lengths of distances to V. Mm. In particular, I could use L moves each time choosing something from this subtree and something for, from another subtree, but also I could pair them up. I could pair them up zero times, just using each time something from the outside. Mm. This is something I can calculate easily with bottom up DP. And Otherwise, I think I will know the maximum number of pairs that I cr can create inside this subtree. And then I should be able to merge two subtrees. Mm. 
because maybe it's an issue that here one vertex is here one is the parent and that's it then I cannot pair them up mm. then dp of v will just be max number of operations inside this subtree of operations there inside this subtree mm, and then to merge two things I will use something like let's say that that was dp of u that was dp of v here we have dp of u I will make dp of u plus dp of v plus uh, minimum of sizes something like that mm. basically we are doing the maximum possible number of pairs between them then one of them is completely used up and here some vertices are used so the number of pairs will be just uh, mean of sizes plus dp of u I think will not matter because we don't create pairs there inside and it will be almost dp of v because we had that many pairs I think it will be minimum of that we can have that many pairs and this many extra pairs between the two subtrees comma and just the number of to total size like the size of u plus size of v divided by 2 because we know we want the number of pairs I would think that this is the how we merge two trees two subtrees then we need to figure out how to go to the root like how to go from a child and its subtree to a parent uh, and that sounds easy like we don't increase this value at all because parent we say cannot be pulled together with somebody that is below and at the end here you want that dp to be all the pairs dp of v is the maximum number of operations in the subtree and we want that to be just the number of ones divided by two mm, i will later read the proof then lemma b mm, they have something else or maybe not Le because I didn't have lemma b let's call an operation special if the LCA of two chosen tokens is the root there is a valid sequence of operations that starts with zero more non-special moves followed by zero or more special moves so we first do something for subtrees and then for the root uh, for each vertex, vertex x from leaves to the root we compute the following values when we consider the subtree rooted at x the number of tokens, the sum of distances, yeah, I said that, the minimum possible value of the sum of distances from each token to the root, when we are out to perform. Okay, not only the number of operations matters, but also that I forgot about using L. L says, what is the number of operations? My DP was the number of operations, so it, in dec it decreased L by some value. Then the set of possible values is that, suppose, mm, for each y, uh, once again, then the set of possible values of the sum of distances to the vertex are that suppose that 
y are children of x to compute law for x we do the following for each child we choose the value as i it should be a value between low and high of that child with the correct parity replace s by s plus count mm. This is more complicated than one I drew, but I think I was very close. I said that I maximize the number of operations in a subtree. They should do something equivalent. They find the minimum possible value of the sum of distances from each token to the root. So my DP was their high minus low. They minimize that. I maximize the difference. Sum of distances minus the value of the sum of distances. The difference high minus low is equal to two times the number of operations used. And here instead of minimizing with that size I will have like the sum of L, something like that. Mm, and that's roughly it. They also care about the value of each child modulo 2 because we cannot pair everybody inside. But I think it isn't an issue in my version because they chose to compute low, I chose to compute the difference, high minus low. Mm, submissions, all submissions. Problem E. Uh, status accepted. I think if I go to the last page, I will see some fast submissions here. Let's let's open Petr's code. Solve. For each vertex he runs function solve. And what does solve do? Here it is. Mm. For E in edges that go down. If number of tokens is smaller than zero than that. Total moves some max. Largest mean this is not easy to understand. Uh, Schwistak. Expand. That's better. DFS gets vertex V and parent P. For neighbors in uh, that. To sons we push back the thing returned by DFS to what is res. It returns several values, D, S, C. I don't think I will understand that with just single letters. I'm trying to find some code that is easy to understand. But I didn't find any so far. because maybe somebody has similar implementation to mine at least they maximize something I hope this is the number of moves the number of operations that can be done but nobody uses meaningful names.
Nope. Mm, I'm losing hope. Again, some maximum. Okay, DFS max min max max. Max min is that. Okay, I think I give up. Um, I'm happy with my my solution. It looks at least close to the editorial solution. Maybe it would turn out that there are some issues after I implement it. But I had good ideas. Mm. And there is some D, there is some C. Uh, but maybe I will not go through them today. What else should I do? Do I have something in current notes? I don't think so. My next YouTube video will be binary search lecture, I think. Some people ask about more problems from recent code forces round, but I think I need to start doing lectures. This is the most valuable content there can be. Mm. Of course, binary se search is something quite easy. Mm. While well, I could also do harder lectures, but I want to see how it goes. And I will try recording it instead of making a stream. And to requ recording requires more, more time. Mm. Current notes, plans, lectures, yeah. Okay. I think I'm done for today. The stream was shorter, three hours. But also I have more stuff to do today. Mm. So that will be it. Tomorrow will be a longer stream, like six hours or so, because I start in the morning and I have a lot of time. Okay, I can close that. I went through the whole chapter one in Competitive Programmer's Handbook. The first part was in some other stream a month ago or so. I think it was boring programming stream number four or five. Mm, and now I finished the first chapter. I will soon continue with the next chapter. What else? What else? I can change this to bigger size because it should be bigger than what is next. No, it shouldn't be that big. That was fine. Mm, maybe even without bolt at all. Yeah, that's that's even better. Mm. And one last thing is I will take a look at things that I should still move. Subscribe to my second to my first channel if you haven't Richter, youtube.com slash Richter. I moved all the mm, boring programming streams, so I will remove those two videos. This one, this one, because they are now on Richter too. I need to also move boring programming stream number six. I didn't saw I didn't see this one previously. And this one is about competitive programmers handbook part one. Mm. I'm creating a nice map. Mm. Okay. Yes, do I do something with CP's mm -hmm. handbook? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Mm. 
I just like I don't see anything related to competitive programmers handbook. It was open for one minute, but that's it. Do you remember? Check that. I think for now my Maybe it was titled from the previous stream. Uh, boring programming stream. Five. Yeah, okay, so five is already competitive programmer's handbook, and I guess here the title state. Terminal. Yeah, I'm doing here something with CP's handbook. Below zero, and this is what tracking, dark tracking. Because the search tree is usually large, and it will see the observations can be explicitly Something about recursion, meet in the middle. I can even check where it is. Meet in the middle. Okay, I guess I finished then exactly at chapter 5, sub, -chap sub chapter 5, and I correctly started with 6 now. Mm, this video will is now only right now it's on both channels it should be here too yeah boring programming stream 5 re-uploaded uh, but soon it will be removed from this place to leave everything cleaner at Richter 1 and maybe also something else will be moved like problem solving basically here there should be videos hash code was a stream yes it was a stream Streams are a bit lazy on my part because they don't require so much effort, no preparation, no cutting and so on, but they are less valuable because of that. I'm not reshooting anything, I'm not rethinking what to say. Mm. Okay. Mm. We were done for today. Uh, next stream tomorrow, likely it will be re related to coding interviews, because I consider that as a possible like, business to do in the future. Mm, I will continue checking out platforms and planning what should be explained in what way. I will start planning some course, I think. You can watch me tomorrow mm, doing that. And I will try before Friday making the binary search lecture. Maybe even I will start today. Uh, thanks, Shroud. Thank you all for commenting. And yeah, see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Have a good day or evening. See ya.